has been accused of encouraging national disunity and promoting its own political agenda after publishing a story on its website using the terms Invasion Day and Australia Day interchangeably. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And it's only a month into the new year, but the ABC is already under fire. This time for dividing the nation over this headline and tweet about Australia's National Day. What to do on Australia Day, Invasion Day, in 2021. One of Australia's most contentious dates is here again. The article was innocent enough, a handy guide to Australia Day events and planned protests in the major capitals. But calling it Invasion Day and claiming it was so divisive inevitably sparked a backlash on Twitter. Shocked and disgusted in this headline. I'm not against a date change, but this is not the role of the national broadcaster. It's Australia Day, not Invasion Day. As the attacks rolled in, the ABC initially stuck with the headline and attempted to justify using the name. As Sunrise explained... Advice given to ABC program teams was that the two dictionaries list Survival Day and Invasion Day as roughly synonymous with Australia Day. And given the variety of terms in use and the different perspectives on the day that the ABC is going to cover over the course of the long weekend, it would be inappropriate to mandate staff use any one term over others in all contexts. That arcane defence posted on the ABC website in response to the critics prompted The Australian to serve up this damning front page headline. ABC deems Australia Day inappropriate for staff. Which, of course, was not quite true, as ABC News Breakfast host Michael Rowland tried to make clear to viewers. The default definition, Lisa, for Australia Day is Australia Day. We are simply acknowledging that uh, Indigenous groups and other people do refer alternatively to that day as either Invasion Day or Survival Day, just reflecting on opinion out there. So uh, uh, it should be no big thing and we should point out, I mean, I should point out at least that uh, the, the reading those News Corp headlines, you get a yeah. slightly warped view on what we're on about, mm. which is, I guess, no great surprise. But that defence wasn't quite true either, because the ABC's headline had officially adopted the term. And by then the ABC had lost control of the story anyway and was being given a good murdocking by the telly with this front page. Auntie's Oz Day Rift. Which came with a double page spread inside, a scathing editorial and this Warren Brown cartoon. I've heard the locals could be difficult. And soon the politicians were also piling in, with Communications Minister Paul Fletcher, who initially declined to comment, calling on the ABC invaders to retreat. The ABC clearly got it wrong. This was a, an inaccurate statement, this uh, online uh, item by the ABC, and I've called on them to correct it. And a few hours later, the ABC did just that, allowing Sky News and others to kick Auntie again with this breaking news. The ABC has backed down following backlash over a headline referring to Australia Day as being interchangeable with Invasion Day. This article listed events occurring in capital cities tomorrow, with the two titles given equal place to describe the public holiday. But after bipartisan backlash, the ABC has now changed the headline to remove Invasion Day from its lead and declared its policy is to use the term Australia Day. All in all, a textbook bungle from beginning to end. Wrong for ABC News to use the headline in the first place, silly not to fix it with the minimum of fuss, and embarrassing when the climb down eventually came because it appeared the ABC was buckling to political pressure. To sum it up, a lesson in how not to handle a crisis, or indeed create one in the first place. For some Australians, of course, having Australia Day on 26th of January is contentious, and for most Indigenous Australians it is certainly not a day to celebrate. As one Invasion Day protest organiser, Ian Brown, told the project. We're still at a disadvantage on our own country. Um, it's been 233 years since, since our first contact here and our situation hasn't got much better. This year, TV News covered several Invasion Day rallies, with this one in Sydney attended by thousands. So, how did it go? Was it violent? Well, that depends on which network you watched. Here is Nine's 6pm News. Australia Day, Invasion Day, but January 26 in the centre of Sydney will be remembered as a day of compromise. Police and protesters had shaped up. I promise to you, I'll do my best, but you go and try and make sure you, do, you guys do your best too. Before last minute talks delivered a truce. Can we do it? Yep. They honoured black deaths in custody, raised their fists in salute and vowed to remain peaceful. 
Over on 10, the message was much the same. But on 7, it was a very different story. While acknowledging the event was mostly peaceful, it opened its coverage with this. <laughs> Refusing to leave and in defiance of health orders. Police were left with no choice but to take down a handful of troublemakers. Officers unapologetic arresting four in Hyde Park. So, which account would you believe? Well, 9 and 10 also reported those four arrests, but they allowed the police to explain... There was a small group of, of protesters who weren't part of the organised group. With the exception of those few at the end, um, they were compliant, they were socially distant, and I thought they were, they were very well behaved. But 7 did not use that message and instead had this quote from the Assistant Commissioner. There were um, a lot of people that were coming in quite quickly and, uh, and obviously that fed into our operational decision-making. Same day, same rally, same set of facts, but two very different stories. Just goes to show, we can't always trust what TV lets you see and hear. But now, to the courts, and a major setback for the Fin Review's most colourful, controversial and costly columnist. The former boss of a venture capital company, who was called a feminist cretin, has been awarded $280,000 in damages in a defamation case. Ouch. So, who penned the abusive line? Yes, the notorious Joe Aston, famous for delivering his column from Los Angeles and for the nasty way in which he can carve up his victims. He's been vigorous. He is a no-holds-bar columnist for the Financial Review. He's probably one of the most read columnists in the Financial Review. But in this case, Justice Lee said he'd overstepped, effectively bullying Elaine Steed, who was a director of Blue Sky. Blue Sky was a shocking billion-dollar corporate collapse that happened while Elaine Stead was the company's head of venture capital. And Joe Aston, in a series of columns in 2018 and 2019, made his criticisms sharp and personal. She was not merely a feminist cretin, Aston wrote, but a prodigious destroyer of capital who set fire to other people's money. Dr Stead gave evidence that the attacks had driven her to despair and to thoughts of suicide. And in his judgment last Wednesday, Michael Lee agreed that Aston had crossed the line. He did single her out for focus and engaged in a sustained campaign of offensive mockery, which amounted, in my view, to a form of bullying. And while Justice Lee found Aston was entitled to be savage in his criticism, he said the columnist's opinions had to be based on facts made clear to readers. And he found that parts of Aston's column, quote, have not been shown to be true in substance, and the opinions expressed by Mr Aston could not, as a consequence, be reasonably based. Hence the damages of $280,000 to add to millions of dollars in costs for both sides. Greeting the judgement, even the Finns famed Chanticleer column urged the paper to pay up. But it also put Aston's campaign in context by pointing out... Blue Sky was one of the worst corporate collapses of the past five years, and yet no one has been held accountable for what happened. Aston was providing that accountability, but his key mistake was to go too far with his attack. As Justice Lee told Aston's lawyer after two weeks of hearings... Your client is entitled to very trenchant criticism and to be entertaining and to be acerbic, but I can't help feeling that we wouldn't be here if he had have chosen his words with less, how can I put it, vitriol. Aston, of course, is one of Australia's most caustic commentators. And last week, Crikey recalled some of his previous personal assaults. Like this one on Kevin Rudd in 2019. Kevin is no intellectual. He's barely a sophomore with a serious face. And this one on Peter Fitzsimons, a fellow columnist for the Nine Papers. Fitzy is a stupid person's idea of a smart person. And this odious line about Jerry Harvey and News Corp, which, wrote Aston... Guzzles Jerry's warm kombuna bull sperm by the pailful so its publishers can shake down the rabid old fool for the very last $40 million print advertising account they're ever going to see. Charming stuff, just like Joe's nasty homophobic slurs against former News Corp writer Darren Davidson that we pinged him for back in 2018. Paul Lurch can't count unless his mouth is full. Aston has also been accused more than once of anti-Semitism, apologising last year to business consultant Barry Lewin for calling him the Melbourne Jewish establishment's favourite fixer. And it's not the first time that Aston has cost his employer cash. 
In 2014, he was ordered to pay former News Corp boss Kim Williams $95,000 after reporting wrongly that he had stormed out of a meeting at the Sydney Opera House Trust. Add the latest $280,000 payment to Elaine Stead, plus some $3 million in total costs, and it is an expensive lesson in what you can and cannot get away with. But is the verdict an assault on free speech, as the Finn Review tried to claim in its editorial? Not according to the judge, or to lawyer Michael Bradley, who summed it up in crikey. Joe Aston's lazy journalism was his downfall. Fair criticism is still valid. Gossip columnists have plenty of scope to dig and flay and insult, but the devil is in getting the details right. Nine is considering an appeal and says it stands by Aston and the AFR's coverage. You can read their full statement on our website. But now to New Year resolutions, and one that some in the media have clearly not yet made. A new year often brings new resolutions, of course, to eat well, to get fit, to drink more water. But despite the best of intentions, a change in lifestyle can be difficult to maintain. With the recent Weight Watchers survey finding lack of motivation as the top barrier. So, who did today get on to talk about kicking those COVID kilos? Three happy Weight Watchers members, of course, like mum and social media influencer Mandy Brown. Uh, for me, WW is not just about a number on the scale. So it's a way of life. Like Tom said, it's it's a healthy lifestyle and it's sustainable. It's something you can, you can carry on through your entire life. Regular Media Watch viewers will probably know where this one's going. Weight Watchers, or WW as they like to be called, paid handsomely for that six minute editorial plug. But Nine did at least fess up after a fashion. Today's health segment brought to you by new MyWW Plus. Lose weight all with one app. But there was no such clarity with this story from the weight loss queen. On the front cover of Sunday's Body and Soul, delivered inside News Corp's tabloids around the country. I'm breaking up with my scales. Why everything you know about weight loss is wrong and how to finally get it right this year. Yes, it was Mandy again. And inside the mag, she was looking fit and fabulous as Body and Soul shared her secrets of shedding the pounds and keeping them off. Through the WW app, she gradually changed the way she approached food, exercise, sleep and her mental health. She'd fostered a community of supportive individuals who kept her motivated, as well as support from the WW team 24-7. One of that team, WW's head of nutrition, also got space in Body and Soul to spruik the WW new app. The app is really the first of its kind in terms of a program that touches on sleep, food, activity, mindset and stress at large. Yes, it's just fabulous what WW can do. And in case you missed that message from the journalist, Mandy was also there in an ad to remind us how good it all is. Mandy lost 24 kilos. But, of course, Mandy does not do all this promotion out of the goodness of her heart. She is an ambassador for WW, whose job it is to push the company in interviews and ads like this. With the at-home workouts, it makes it easier to fit exercise into your schedule. Now, you might think the magazine would tell its readers that their cover girl is a paid plant. I'd also admit that seven of the magazine's 15 pages, including two other separate stories on the WW app, were just a glorified ad. Just like these other stories on WW that Body and Soul's been running online with Georgia. I lost 55 kilos and going cold turkey really worked for me. And Elvie. I lost 59 kilos in two years and didn't diet once. Yet we could find no disclosure on any of those stories that they were paid plugs until we alerted the magazine to the fact. We asked WW how much it forked out for all this free coverage. They did not respond. As for Body and Soul, editor Sarah Lamarquin told us... The article was part of a broader commercial partnership and, unfortunately, inadvertently, this piece did not include this acknowledgement. Unfortunately, inadvertently, four times in a row. Whoops. And finally, we'll leave you with this touching father and son moment on national radio. Jonathan Swan is a national political correspondent at Axios and joins me now from Washington, D.C. Welcome back to breakfast. Hi, Dad. <laughs> we'll leave that to later, darling. So, did Swan Senior keep his word after their 10-minute chat? Well, not quite. Jonathan, thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Swan is a national political correspondent at Axios and, yes, a blood relative. A blood relative? Come on, Norman. Next time you don't need to be so shy. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can stream or download the programme and read the statement from Nine. And don't forget, Media Bytes every Thursday on your favourite social media platform. But for now, until next week, goodbye.